Hello, everybody. I'm sorry I can't be there with you today, but uh, the Spirit of the Lord is truly present wherever we are. As Christ says, where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of them. And uh, I give thanks for this technology that allows us to connect even if I can't be there in person. So today we're going to take a look at Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 16. Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 16. Now, as you're looking uh, for that in your Bible and getting to that page, uh, I want to review real quickly what we talked about a couple weeks ago in worship, which is the way the gospel is written. So, again, Mark is the first gospel that we have, and uh, it's also the shortest. And it's almost as if you, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but if you think of the other gospel writers as authors of books, and almost Mark is a journalist. Mark is trying to get down, and then what happened, and then what happened, and then what happened. And so uh, there's not a whole lot of theologizing in Mark. It's more this happened, and then Jesus went here and did this and healed this person and said this, and then he got up and he went here and did this and said this and this. And uh, I say that because it's important for our story today. We are in Mark chapter 10, and there's going to be a shift. There's a shift in urgency here. This takes place after the transfiguration where Jesus has appeared on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. And we see this shift that where Jesus has gone from uh, healing people and telling his disciples, don't tell anybody what I did, to now preparing them for the fact that he's going to be crucified. And, and it feels urgent because Mark's gospel is so short. We have 16 short chapters. But it's important for us to remember that these 16 chapters cover three years of Jesus' ministry. So it feels like a sharp right turn for Mark from don't tell anybody who I am to you got to get ready because I'm not always going to be here is not as sharp a turn as, as it might read. So we see this uh we're now at the point where uh, the word has gotten out about Jesus, all the things that he has done, and he has upset the religious officials. That's where we pick up the story today. Again, Mark chapter 10, uh, beginning at verse 2, reading through 16. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Now, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. My friends, this is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Amen. All right. So some Pharisees come and they try to test Jesus. This happens a lot in the Gospels. We see it quite frequently. And they're asking him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now again, what they're trying to do is they're, getting, they're trying to get Jesus to say something that will go against their law. But what they don't understand is what Jesus has said in another Gospel, which is that he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. So what he does is he turns that statement, that question, back on them. He says, you don't understand. It was because of your hardness of hearts that, that Moses wrote this into law to begin with. In other words, you are going into a relationship 
thinking about how little you have to do as opposed to how much you can do with the love that you have for another person. And yes, this is true of marriage. It's a very specific passage, but we can also zoom out and think about that for any type of relationship. For those of you that are watching this that aren't married, this still applies to you as well. Any relationship you enter into, whether it's a friendship or a romantic relationship or even a business relationship, are you going into that thinking, what is the least amount that I can do? Or are you going into that relationship thinking, what is it that I can offer to this other person? One view has us in mind, ourselves. The other view has the other person in mind, what we can do for them. That is how we are called to love another one. And then we read that the disciples see these children coming around, people wanting Jesus to bless their children, but the disciples see these children as a distraction, as a nuisance, as an annoyance. But once again, they don't understand. Their hearts have been hardened. They see only uh, the, the noise and the excitement and the rambunctiousness of these children. What they don't see is the hearts, the excitement, and the love and the enthusiasm that these children have. So Jesus turns around and he rebukes them. Now it's interesting here, and it's important to note, Jesus doesn't say that the kingdom of heaven belongs to these children. Right? In verse 14, he, he says, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. So yes, it belongs to the children, these people that, Jesus, that the disciples think are annoying. But it belongs to those who have hearts like children. Who have that enthusiasm, that joy, that willingness to accept uh, the, the mercy and the grace and the love that Jesus has. So we learned two lessons in our passage today. One is, when we enter into a relationship, any type of relationship, we, had, we should enter into it asking ourselves, what can I do for the other person? Not what is the least I can do and still have my needs met. What is it that I can do to serve the other person? And we should enter into those relationships with the joy and the enthusiasm of a child. For it is those such as these that receive the kingdom of God. We seek to love, thinking about what we can do for others. And we seek to love with that innocent joy and enthusiasm that children bring. This is the grace and mercy that we receive from our Lord when our hearts are softened in this way. Let's pray. Almighty God, in the same way you came into this world, not to be served, but to serve. So should we enter into any relationship, seeking ways that we can serve the other. Soften our hearts, Lord. Open our hearts and minds to all the possibilities that you have provided for us in this world. Help us to wake up each day the enthusiasm and the joy of a child, knowing that even in the midst of storms and disasters, that your blessing is still there. It's in the name of Christ our Lord that we pray these and we pray all things. Amen. And now, my friends, I invite you to go into this world with the hope of a child, with the joy of a child, 
with faith like a child. I invite you to go into this world with the courage and the hope of God's people. I pray that you would follow wherever Christ might be leading you and that you would minister to each other along the way. And as you go, go knowing that the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the strength of the Holy Spirit is with you today and will be with you every day of your life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.